Um, welcome to everybody. I'm Jan Masaoka. I'm the CEO of the California Association of Nonprofits. We say Cal Nonprofits for short. And this is a nonprofit town hall with Assemblywoman Laura Friedman. And you can see her there from the Glendale, Burbank, Las Vegas, Hollywood, kind of that whole kind of range of organizations there. Having grown up in Northern California, I confess that uh, it's all LA to me, uh, but I know LA is such an important part of our state that it's really great that there are more districts there. So just to say a few words about her, um, uh, Laura Friedman used to serve on the City Council of Glendale, including serving as mayor. And those of you who are in Glendale know that there's a very nonprofit friendly atmosphere in city government and throughout Glendale. Uh, she's also become really well known for her work, uh, really spearheading the first statewide in the country, the first statewide ban on the sale of animal fur. Uh, and she's also just been um, a real uh, conservation champion and uh, all kinds of things related to the environment as well as to other matters in particular. Um, but so I think one of the things that we have always appreciated her, about her is her commitment to nonprofit community. And one of the ways she's demonstrated that is that she signed on to the letter circulated in the assembly to ask the governor for, for COVID related contracting relief for nonprofits. And all of you who have government contracts know how important this is because we know that nonprofits are, are unable to, I mean, I was just, I, I was just on a meeting yesterday, a Zoom meeting yesterday for a nonprofit that has county money and they want to make a $60 change, literally six, six, zero, $60 change from one budget item to the next because of COVID, they want to spend that much extra money on hand sanitizers. And they have, the county is telling them, not LA County, different county is telling them that they need to get a budget modification before they can do that. So it's that kind of uh, flexibility um, that Laura Friedman has stood with California nonprofits and over a thousand nonprofits signed on to that same letter. Um, all right, so let me just tell you, I'll make a couple of opening comments here. So welcome everybody. I want to remind everybody to go ahead and continue to put your uh, names and organizations and cities, if you feel like, into the chat box so that we can you can introduce yourselves to all of us. So uh, on a Friday afternoon, you know, when I think we're all can't decide whether right for this next 10 minute period, should we be more worried about COVID or should we be more worried about what? Um, but it looks like this is going to be kind of the signature way we're going to be through the rest of the fall. But during this time, you know, nonprofits have never been more visible, right? People are seeing nonprofits or food banks, health clinics, mental health clinics, child care centers, Meals on Wheels are all stepping up and doing far more than they could ever imagine they could do. And on the other end of the spectrum, you know, every theater and every museum is completely shut down. So we have, and nonprofits exist everywhere on that whole spectrum. And I know that one of the things that we are all looking for um, is some clear direction from the state of California, as well as kind of direct directions that are in line with our counties to help us understand what safe reopening is going to look like. And, um, you know, about one third, just to give you an idea of how interdependent nonprofits and government are. Non community, about one third of our total income comes from government. But on the state California side, actually 32% of Medi-Cal services are delivered by nonprofits. So we're really both part of a really important services supply chain. Uh, and you know, now that there's so much unemployment, it's also important to remember that in California, one in every 14 jobs is located in nonprofits. So we are really a significant employer. And a lot of the way that we do that is because we bring in $40 billion a year from out of state to help support California state services. One of the things that everything's going to really have in halls is because they really give a chance um, for, well, first of all, just to say, you know, to the assemblywoman, you know, just the fact that you're here listening to us and telling us 
the straight scoop directly to nonprofits rather than through some kind of intermediary really means a lot. It says a lot about you and your connection to local nonprofits. And also all of you who are joining the call today, you know, one of the things about a town hall you'll remember from the olden days when they were in person is that not only do we get a chance to hear it directly from elected officials, but we also get a chance to tell them directly. And so one of the things is in addition to the assemblywoman being on today's Zoom session, her staff is also here. So they'll be watching the, the questions, for example, on the chat box and in the Q&A box um, as well. And all of these things will help inform her work as she goes forward. Right. Uh, so uh, we also have a couple of nonprofit folks on the call. On the call, you can see their pictures of them, and they'll get introduced in just a few minutes. But first of all, so Assemblywoman, welcome. And so tell us why were why are you why did you agree to do this town hall to host this town hall, and what what should we be knowing right now about state government and the state of California? Well, thank you, and thanks everyone who's watching right now. First of all, I, of course, want to thank Jan and Lucy and the rest of Cal non, the Cal Nonprofit team for partnering with us on this town hall. You know, I know that none of you are working for Cal Nonprofits because you want to get rich. You are working for Cal Nonprofits because you understand the value that nonprofits add. I wouldn't say that add to our community. I'd say that nonprofits really are the backbone and a major part of our communities. And you understand that they need that institutional support. And by all of the different representatives of nonprofits who are here today to join in, to listen, to um, share with us your thoughts through chat, you help us uh, be able to help you. And in doing so, you help our community. And for that, I'm very grateful. Now, town halls like this are important for me because especially now with COVID and the inability for us to see a lot of our constituents in person, it's a really great way for us to communicate and to communicate to the public and so I, I appreciate your partnership with this. Um, you know, the, we really do listen to the questions, we listen to the comments, we read the chats, because it's our job to amplify the issues that you bring to us and to be aware of them. And we can't do that if we don't have that two-way communication. So don't hold back. You know, we want to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly throughout this, this call so that we can, we can help. Um, and I, of course, want to thank all of the nonprofits for your service. You are our backbones. You are uh, out there to help people, you know, not, to, not for the, the reason of putting money in a shareholder's pocket, but because you felt that there was a need and a mission to fulfill, and you're out there doing that. And many of you that are here, certainly our local panelists are people I've worked with for years, uh, when I was on the city council and, and even before. And so... Their work is incredibly important and I'm, I'm grateful that they're giving us some time today. And I know that the nonprofits are struggling right now, whether it was the tax reform that took money out of your pockets and certainly the impacts of COVID, you are having to do a lot more with a lot less. And we are only beginning to understand the impact that the pandemics had on our communities. Uh, we are trying to stave off a, a I'd say a tidal wave of really bad effects that could be happening in the next year. And we're seeing a lot of that now. Some of it we don't even know. We don't even know what's happening because we have a lot of residents who haven't come forward who need services because in some cases they've never had to look for services in their lives. They don't know what's available to them. In some cases they're making do by asking friends for help and family for help, but it's only a matter of time until that need becomes more evident. So we are trying to find ways of smoothing out that, that need. And it's tough because unlike the federal government, we can't print money in the state. And a lot of the dollars are accounted for or are um, uh, constitutionally or legislatively directed to certain pots that we can't interfere with. So the amount of discretionary money is a lot less than a lot of us would like. And of course, the revenues are shrinking as less people are working and less taxes are being paid. And we don't yet really understand what that impact's going to be on the state. We just don't know yet. So it's a really, really, really challenging and bleak time. I will say that earlier this year, the California Association of Nonprofits, which is a policy alliance of more than 10,000 nonprofits, did send the letter that you mentioned, to, which had 1,200 organizations to government leaders, which made recommendations to address a lot of these challenges that are facing the nonprofits who contract with California. I was one of uh, 30 assembly colleagues who signed a letter 
uh, authored by assembly members Luz Rivas and my um, beloved roommate, Monique Lamone, that supports nonprofits and makes those same requests of state leaders. And next week, we are wrapping up our 2019 2020 session, and we have a lot of ground to cover in the next few days. Um, there are bills that are intended to prevent an even, even greater housing crisis with eviction and mortgage relief, although I will say that the main bill of which I'm a joint author was at the last minute held in rules, so we don't know what its fate is. Um, and we are looking at criminal justice and police reforms, wildfire preventions, and bills to bolster our safety net services for our most vulnerable residents. But all of that is up in the air because we still have to get these bills to the legislature. We have to get them signed. And it's hard to know what's gonna happen over the next week. I, I am a strong uh, vocal supporter of us sticking around as long as it takes in Sacramento to do the work. Um, the governor so far has not been interested in calling a special session. I think if there was ever time that we were special and extraordinary and needed that special session, it's now. But if we don't have a special session, there's no reason we can't hold hearings and I'm going to be calling for those in a week when we start seeing what the gaps are from bills that weren't signed into law. Um, with that, I'll stop and just say that that work won't stop at the end of this month. I will still be around and available and my colleagues will as well. So please don't stop calling on us as a resource when you also need help because there's a lot of us who want to help you help our constituents. Well, uh, Assembly Member, let me ask you a couple of follow-up questions from that kind of intriguing, those intriguing comments. So are you saying that a lot of things are not going to get acted on just because there isn't enough time with, because the shortens, the legislature's time to work on bills is so much shorter this year due to COVID? Yes, that's absolutely right. And anyone who tells you differently hasn't been following the process. First of all, of the hundreds of bills that were introduced earlier in the year, most of those were either pulled by the authors or pulled by the committees themselves because we were dark for an extra three months because of COVID and there just wasn't enough time to hear all of those bills. And normally we would have several hearings and most bills would be referred to more than one committee. This year we each only had one hearing and every bill was only single referred. So bills that were complicated or controversial uh, in many cases were pulled. And you know, if you're gonna do anything really meaningful, you have to do things that are controversial and that are complex and difficult. So a lot of those big overarching bills either weren't heard because there wasn't enough time to really give them a fair hearing or people were concerned that stakeholders didn't have enough of a way to weigh in. Um, so a lot of those bills were pulled off the table. And right now um, there are bills that are being held hostage in both houses uh, as each house tries to get their policy through. And also there are negotiations happening with the governor and the governor's office. So I'm not, I, I am not saying that we won't do something on evictions. I'm not saying that we won't do anything on housing and wildfire. I am saying that we will do less than we had thought we would do at the beginning of the year. I'm telling you that whatever passes is not going to be in anyone's mind perfect. I think we're gonna see a lot of, of triage, band-aid type things when it comes to issues like, like the eviction crisis um, for a variety of reasons. First of all, because it's impossible to get consensus about things that are radical mm -hmm. uh, or, or difficult. I, and it's hard without consensus to get things through right now. And I would say secondly, because we don't really understand yet the scope of the issue. We don't really know what's happening. We don't know how the different local governments own efforts intersect with what we might do at the state level. A lot of our local cities have their own anti-eviction uh, uh, policies in place. Some of them are more aggressive than others. Um, so everyone is scrambling to find ways of protecting tenants. And you know, honestly, the issues that Fresno is facing or an agricultural area in the Central Valley is very different than what we're seeing in Burbank or Los Angeles. And even what we're seeing in Glendale is different than what we're seeing in Pasadena. So there is a place for those local responses as well. And trying to put all of that together when we have not been physically in Sacramento as much as we usually are is really, really challenging. Um, I, you know, I, I have hope that we will do enough to prevent the worst from happening we're not going to do something that's gonna make everyone happy. I mean, there's a lot of, well, I'll just give you an example and then I'll move on to the next question. There are a lot of tenants that want complete 
rent forgiveness, that want rent as long as they're not working to be forgiven and to never have to pay that back. And I totally understand people who want that. On the other hand, there's a lot of landlords who say, if I don't have rent, I will literally lose my building because I haven't been raising my rent because I'm a good landlord. I only have four units and I, I care about my tenants. But if you take away that source of income for me, I can't pay my mortgage. I can't do repairs. There are banks that say, if you make us eat all those mortgages right now, then we have federal obligations that we can't meet. There's a whole chain of, of cause and effect that we are grappling with that makes all of this a lot more complex than it seems. Um, so my particular philosophy is to help the most vulnerable. You know, I think that we need to first protect people who are going to become homeless because of this full stop and figure the rest out as it starts to happen. Because that disaster, not just the humanitarian disaster of that kind of displacement is profound, but it has ripple effects all across our economy if you care more about the economy. And also trying to rehouse those people later is much more expensive than keeping them in the housing they have now. So that's the place I come from. That's why I'm a joint author of 1430, whatever the bill number is that deals with tenant evictions. And I really, really, that 1430. bill come through. I'm a joint author of that bill, the one that's being held in rules. Um, uh, and that bill has mortgage forbearance for small landlords to help them as well. But there are a lot of stakeholders that are not even happy with that on both sides, people who think it's too aggressive and people who think it's not aggressive enough. So this is what we're dealing with in the legislature. Well, I certainly appreciate your candor, even if it's kind of depressing to hear this. Uh, I mean, you've just mentioned housing, criminal justice, safety net, wildfires, I mean, evictions, these are huge issues and we need our legislature to be acting on them. So I'm sorry, what, what do you think nonprofits should be doing about this right now? I would say that nonprofits need to be mindful of the enormity of the issues, the the scarcity of dollars, the huge crises that are playing out across the state and prioritize uh, and realize that there are probably given that we have these huge fires and we're trying to move resources there, that we have people becoming you know, evicted that sometimes the priority that you might think is the top priority because it's in your wheelhouse and of course they're all important may not be the top priority for the state at this moment. To be mindful of that. Um, uh, and you know, we always expect people to advocate, you know, for what they need and what they want. But just just keep in mind that this is going to be uh, bare bones. It's going to be painful, and don't expect that that activities that are not seen as essential are going to get the same amount of funding now that they would have had before this pandemic and before this emergency. And I think that groups that keep that in mind and keep that in perspective and try to maintain, you know, until things get better will fare better than those who get bent out of shape that they're not getting the same amount of funding for as maybe we're giving to wildfire victims right now. Well, we really appreciate that kind of straight talk. Um, you know, one of the things that's been a huge help to nonprofits, of course, has been the uh, PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program loans, um, which are most people are used up or in the process of using up now. Um, so I know our next speaker um, is our policy director from Cal Nonprofits, Lucy Saucedo Carter, to give us a little bit of update on federal stuff. Uh, Lucy. Hi, everyone. Well, I first wanted to say I'm a Burbank native. I was born in mm. Burbank Hospital, which I know no longer exists. So I'm aging myself, dating myself, but um, I am a Burbank native. So, um, I, I, you know, I wish that I had more to report on the, the federal front. Um, as we all know, the House and Senate were not really able to reach an agreement on the various bills that they had um, either introduced or passed. Um, and so we don't yet have a case act two. Um, we, um, and that would provide $600 per week in the um, unemployment insurance supplements. Um, now again, that only passed in the house. So it is, is not law, it's only passed in the house. It also would expand the PPP or paycheck protection program that Jan just referred um, to. 
to include large nonprofits, which has been a real issue for large nonprofits that they've not been eligible for this program. And it would, it would continue the PPP through December. Um, the bill also included relief funds for states and local governments. So I wanted to point that out because I know that that's a big, a big issue between the various bills. Um, and it also provides a lot of other relief programs that we don't have time to get into today. On the other side, we've got, um, on the Senate side, we had the HEALS Act, which was introduced in late July. That would have provide or would provide or said that it would provide um, $200 a week in supplemental unemployment insurance um, and it added the chambers of commerce to the PPP, but it did not add large nonprofits. Now that that bill did talk about a possible round of second round of the PPP. Um, so, uh, but it did not have any state or local government relief included in it. So um, we, you know, that's, those conversations will be happening again when Congress resumes in early September, hopefully. In the meantime, I just want, I know that you all are hearing about this on the news. Um, the president did come up with four documents. He called them executive orders. Actually only one is an executive order. The others are memos. It is, we don't really know what kind of legal power these documents have. Um, some of them are being viewed as, as unconstitutional because they take the power of the purse away from Congress. Um, but I, I did want to just say a word or two about them, um, just, just so that you all have this information because they do affect nonprofits. Um, so one of them would, would provide $300 a week in supplemental uninsurance, um, I mean, uh, unemployment insurance. So, but states are not really signing up for this program. You've got to sign up for it and only a handful of states have signed up so far. And again, it, it's not known where the funding would come for that. And we don't know if there's, if it's legal, if this document is legal. Um, and then there's, there's another order just recommending that some of the, the agency leaders research whether an eviction moratorium should continue and whether there should be mortgage forbearance. So it doesn't actually provide those things. It just says it should be looked into. Um, to your point, Assemblywoman, of, you know, we have to figure out some long-term solutions to this. So there, this, these orders do not provide any kind of long-term solution for this. The one uh, of the four that I think um, may actually stick uh, because the Department of Education can implement it legally um, is the one that would allow student loan borrowers to um, defer their payments through the end of the calendar year without any kind of interest accrual during that time. So, um, so, and we know that that's really important to nonprofits because so many nonprofit employees have significant loan debt. So that is the picture right now. Um, we will know a lot more in September when Congress resumes. And we, I know we're all hoping that there will be a CARES Act 2.0 that will provide some significant relief to our communities. So I will take it back to either the Assemblywoman or Jan. I think the Assemblywoman's going to introduce our two nonprofit guests now. Great. Yes, thank you. The 43rd District is home to a really thriving nonprofit community. And I will say that our nonprofits are really cherished by the community who are, you know, big supporters of our various nonprofits in this in the area. Um, I was asked to invite some nonprofits and it was really hard because there are so many and I know some of them, I think I saw Silver Lake Conservatory of Music in the chat and we've got you know, a lot of really great nonprofits. Um, but two jumped right into, into mine because they're some of my favorites and some that I've worked with for a very long time. So I'm really happy to have with us today Elisa Glickman from Glendale Arts and Albert Hernandez from Family Promise of the Verdugos. I wanted to invite two very different types of nonprofits that work in very different areas, just to give an idea of the different kind of challenges and opportunities that they um, are facing right now. And I wanna thank them also for, for their time and for being so generous to be with us here today. So I'll let each of you introduce your groups, introduce yourselves and make any comments before we ask questions. Albert, do you want to go first? Or? Well, you're on the screen, Elisa. You might as well go. Go ahead. All right, here we go. Hi, I'm uh, Elisa Glickman. I am the CEO of Glendale Arts. As Laura mentioned, we are the management company of the Alex Theater in Glendale. 
Um, the Alex will be celebrating its 95th birthday on um, September 5th with a huge Alex 95 telethon, which um, Laura, thank you so much for agreeing to um, be a part of that. Um, and that it, it, the Alex is one of these places in our community um, where we are, we operate as a rental facility, but we offer opportunities for nonprofit production companies to produce and house their shows there. Um, more than 80,000 people walk through our doors and we generate um, well over $1.6 million in economic activity every year, um, pre-virus. Um, so we shut down on March 16th um, and have not been able to open since um, that date. Um, we don't know when um, our 1400 seat facility will be able to open to the public. And even if we are able to open to the public, how many people will be able to serve? Um, many of our performance groups and resident companies um, are in a similar position you know, that we're in, in terms of being able to generate enough earned and contributed income to support their paid and volunteer staff, their artistic vision, et cetera. Um, so yeah, Albert and I work in, in very different um, divergent fields, um, but the creative economy is one of those that really drives, especially Assemblymember Freeman's district, um, but California as a whole. And you know, on the tales of increased minimum wage and AB5 and, and all of these other challenges. And, and again, I thank you, Assemblymember Friedman, for your leadership on AB5 and, and trying to work with our artists and independent workers to find a pathway um, for them to continue to work. It was a challenge before the virus. Um, and now it's an increasingly, more ch uh, increasingly larger challenge. And many of the artists that we work with talk to me all the time about their fears about homelessness and their fears about not being able to pay their mortgages or student loans or their car payments, or um, put food on the table. You know, we have some challenges with the unemployment um, departments here in the state of California, um, and many of those artists are relying on those things. So there's there's a whole myriad of challenges that comes with the creative economy um, beyond just operating a public venue, um, and it and it really does trickle down to all of the important bits that Laura was talking about in terms of ability to, to make a living, ability to feel safe and secure in, in one's financial stability. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and really talk about the, the large S and the importance of the arts to not only our nonprofit community, but certainly our economy as a whole. It's all you, Albert. Thanks, Alyssa. Hi, everyone. I'm Albert Hernandez. I'm executive director of Family Promise of the Verdugos. Uh, we are one of over 200 family promises all around the nation. Um, our family promise um, has two offices, one in Burbank, one in Glendale, and we're a nonprofit homeless service provider. Uh, we just celebrated 10 years on July 1st. Very proud of that. Um, you know, our organization has been, our core program has, has always been our 90 day program, and it's a program in partnership with local congregations in Burbank, Glendale, Eagle Rock, and some of the neighboring communities. And those congregations have, for the last, just provided space to host our families overnight. Our families would rotate from church to church um, in the evening hours and, and be provided uh, dinner and breakfast, and even member churches provided. Um, arts and crafts and homework tutoring and whatnot. And then during the day, the families are actually at our day center located in Burbank. Families were receiving um, case management. Um, they have access to showers and laundry facilities um, and access to internet and Wi-Fi so that these families can apply for employment and housing and whatnot. And I'll tell you, when COVID hit and um, churches shut down, our model had to pivot tremendously um, because we, we truly relied on our congregations. Listen, we're not a faith-based community, but we happen to partner with the faith-based community. And it was a, it's a great partnership that allows our families to sleep at churches overnight when, the, when these churches are not in operation. So we truly had to change our model from um, having our families stay in, in congregations to now having to be placed in motels 
which has taken a big chunk of our budget, um, something we never expected to have to pay for in the last 10 years. So we immediately had to figure out how are we going to raise money? How are we going to afford a, a new budget line item that we never had to take on before? And so it was scary. And I think uh, many people in the chat room and watching on Facebook Live probably really um, understand what we're going through because in most cases, in Family Promise case, at least that following week after COVID hit, we had a, a, a gala plan. We had a large gala uh, with nearly 400 attendees planned. It was scheduled to happen at, at a local um, um, vent, uh, amusement park and we had to cancel. We, we postponed, we, tr we tried to push the event to June um, and our committee was in full, you know, excited about pushing it to June. Don't worry, we'll be able to have our event in person in a few months. But as COVID and this pandemic, um, as time progressed, we just realized it wasn't feasible. And, and I think there's a lot of nonprofits right now that really rely on the in-person galas or luncheons and whatnot. And now we've got to change that whole dynamic. All we see is, uh, you know, I, 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 I love our nonprofit world because so many of us share our experiences and ideas. And I think Cal Nonprofits is fantastic at this, but we're all now trying to figure out what's the new latest uh, virtual event that we can offer for, for um, our supporters. Um, and that, that's what's tough is not knowing uh, what's going to happen in the, in the near future. Even later today, this afternoon, I don't know what's going to change. And it really is pretty scary with what's going on in the world right now. I'll tell you, and I think I had five minutes, and, and you can't get me started, uh, Jan, because I keep on going. So please stop me whenever uh, my time is up. But I, I mean, we had foundations in the first um, month call us and say, listen, I, you know, our, our investment accounts uh, might be impacted. I don't know if we can continue supporting you. You know, a couple of foundations had told us that. And then for many of us, our fiscal uh, year here at Family Promise starts July 1st. How in the world am I going to create a budget in with this pandemic? I don't know what to expect. You know, am I going to have a gala this year and be able to bring in 125,000? I don't know. So it's, it's every day we're adapting, and our organization focuses primarily on homelessness. So uh, when given the opportunity during this town hall, we, we definitely have had to partner with the city of Glendale, city of Burbank, and now the, uh, the county of LA to um, adopt and implement new programs for rental relief. You know, this, this pandemic has definitely caused some hardship, but I, I think there's also some, uh, there's also opportunity to implement new programs as well. Oh, thanks. You know, Albert, that story just really brings to life what it really feels like that you know, what you're trying to do, cancellation of your gala, not knowing what's going to be happening this afternoon. That's very, um, you just said a lot of really important things there. Thank you. Uh, can I just go back to something that the way Lisa mentioned that I was going to ask the assemblywoman to comment on, which is related to the arts in particular and AB5. There was an advanced question about that, as well as a couple of them now in the chat line. And, you know, um, we've been working with California Arts on this, and I think we at Cal Nonprofits, you know, believe that it, there, it's important for employees and contractors to be correctly classified, but at the same time, there are some jobs in the nonprofit community that don't fit in to the framework that's used for that, and a lot of those, not all of them, but many of those are in the arts. So, Assemblywoman, we know there's a bill right now being considered that hasn't gotten shoved off to the side and um, do you, can you tell us more about that and um, and your role with it, if any? Sure, well, in our district, we've got a lot of people who are arts professionals. So AB5 has really impacted um, a lot of our constituents. And um, so I, and in some cases, I believe um, people, who are in classifications that have never really been classified as full as employees you know kind of got caught up in this and in some cases they had been you know and in some cases probably people had been misclassified under the old law as well so i think sussing a lot of that out it's it's, comp it's complicated and you're not going to have one piece of legislation that's going to do that for you in any case you know there's always going to be questions about some of these you know, jobs, particularly more non-traditional types of jobs. And in a lot of ways, uh, the workplace is changing. You know, it's been changing for years. 
So AB5 came out of a court decision having to do with a trucking company. And so it basically struck down a lot of the framework of the, of the way that the old laws uh, uh, about classification were being used. And I know that there's some disagreement about whether the Dynamax decision was broad enough to cover a lot of different classifications. I will tell you that I myself asked a member of the California Supreme Court about whether they would have interpreted that law as broadly as, you know, advocates are saying. And they said, absolutely, the law was meant to be brought, that court decision was meant to be broadly uh, applied. Um, so that said, AB5, um, to me, was always a work in progress because it, it, had, it had exemptions for certain fields, but it was, it was not adequate for many of our fields, for people who were journalists, for people, many of the arts professionals, people who are sound mixers with their own equipment. There's a whole range of people, many of whom live in our district, who were impacted in some cases negatively by AB5. And so when we started to realize, you know, kind of what that was, what that was causing on that population of workers, I began to advocate with the original author of AB5 about having exemptions for a lot of those different um, occupations. And so there is a bill right now, I, I, the number I think is in the chat, but I, I, you know, you'd have to, to say what it is. The bill is moving and it will move. It has an urgency clause and will take effect immediately. That will help within a few months giving relief to journalists who are freelancers um, for many of our employees. I will say that there, you know, this is not as cut and dry as there are, as, as a lot of advocates would like to, to, to say that it is. I have been contacted by many actors, many who say we lack a lot of workplace protections that we should have. We need to have workers comp if we're injured, you know, in a theater. We want to be able to have social, to have access to unemployment. You know, if it wasn't for the CARES Act, most of these people right now in our district who are receiving CARES Act and benefits through EDD would not be eligible for it because they have not been employees and paying into EDD. So it's a more complicated uh, uh, situation and there are a lot of opinions on lots of sides. I will say, it, you know, the bottom line is we absolutely need to make sure that people who are, you know, workers who are freelancers and enjoying a good, good life through being freelancers who are those specialized workers, those journalists, those mixers, uh, those musicians should be able to be correctly classified as freelance because it's, it's what they want. At the same time, we have to make sure that workers who are on the, you know, sort of the lower end of the economic scale are not exploited. I will tell you, you know, people act like this is partisan. This is a lot less partisan than folks might think. I have a Republican in my district who's a very conservative Republican who came to me and said, AB5 was the correct rule, and I'll tell you why. He owns a janitorial service, and he has always paid his janitors benefits and given them health care and given them sick days and paid for their, social, their workers' comp. Well, for over the last several years, he said many, most of his competitors reclassified those janitors as independent contractors. These are minimum wage workers, made them responsible for their own workers comp or for not having it for their own benefits. And he now is at a major disadvantage when he goes out in the marketplace to bid jobs. So because he didn't want to exploit his workers, and that's what that is, the idea that these janitors are independent contractors is crazy. But there are people who, there are employers who were doing those kinds of, of misclassifications. And so I, you know, I think that anybody who is, you know, advocating on this needs to keep those kinds of workers in mind, that we can't remove protections for vulnerable workers. Um, we know, we can't just jettison that. But at the same time, I agree that there's a whole group of people who have never been, who've always been independent contractors, who, who have businesses that pay for their health care, that if they are switching jobs a lot, don't get that deduction anymore and are starting to pay out of pocket now for health care. You know, there's a, there's a, there's, there's, I think that there's some flexibility that needs to be built into this to allow those kinds of, of independent contractors to continue while protecting um, workers. So, uh, you know, I would just say, keep in mind, you know, do people need workers comp? Who's going to be paying that? I will say one other thing to the theater groups out there that are grappling with this. There are ways that you can, as a group, buy workers comp. 
you know, in a pool. There are, you know, there's efficiencies that you can get by working together that I would absolutely um, uh, suggest uh, looking into. And I, you know, I think that Cal nonprofits maybe is a way to help with, with some of that. And, and there are some efficiencies of scale, whether it's payroll services, workers comp, um, that, you know, by having very small organizations joined together, there's probably, you know, some real cost savings that can be found for some of this. Thanks. You know, it, it's, it's, I just have to comment that it's really a pleasure to see how well informed you are of all the different sides of this issue. And it is certainly something that it's, it's, it's very easy to not see how nuanced and complex the issue really is. So thank you for that. You know, we have a couple of questions, one from advance and one today that are related to people having trouble with working with government agencies, either finding, either licensing, getting their licenses changed up a little bit because they need to have that during the COVID crisis or, you know, having some services that now might be very, might be very important, for example, mm -hmm. the school district haven't been in the past. But you know, it's harder to reach out to people right now and find out who are the right contacts in government. So what, what advice would you have for them? I would say, first of all, to, you know, to, to contact my office. When you run into these barriers or you're not sure, we have people that are working, they will pick up the phone. Um, we have sent, we have elevated many of these kinds of, of issues to the governor's office and in some cases gotten very fast responses. Um, we need to be as a government right now very flexible when it comes to a lot of these issues. I'll just give you an example. Um, a lot of our restaurants during the pandemic were still getting food um, deliveries, uh, fresh food deliveries from their vendors and they couldn't just turn that off. They had entered into long-term contracts, they were getting these deliveries, they couldn't operate as regular restaurants and even if they were doing delivery, in some cases it wasn't enough for the food. And if you were like a bakery, most people aren't having food delivered from their bakery. So what they were doing was they were pivoting, they were being creative, and they opened little pop-up grocery stores in their spaces. So instead of having to fight the crowd or stand in line at Trader Joe's or Ralph's, you could go to your bakery to buy eggs and flour and yeast, and it was great. The public loved it, it was a lifeline to those, those bakeries. But what happened was County Health came in and told them all they had to stop doing this because they didn't have grocery store licensing. And so we found out about this and, and elevated this issue to county health. And within just a couple of days, they reversed course. And they said, all right, restaurants and bakeries, as long as you can do A, B, and C, follow these very basic health safety guidelines, you can still operate as a pop-up grocery. So we have agent partner agencies, whether it's county health or the state, that are, if, that are willing to be flexible to help you know, these businesses pivot. I just threw a bunch of language into one of my colleagues' bills about allowing restaurants to use their parking lots um, for food service instead of parking without, you know, cities having to do CEQA on that lack of parking. You know, we have got to do stuff like that right now to let people think outside the box and be flexible in this new normal. And it might be our new normal for a couple of years. So, reach out to us. I am looking for ways to help my nonprofit community, my business community operate. So if you need us to say to the governor, they can't do this right now. They can't re-review this. There's no staff and it's not going to put anyone in danger. Give them six months. You have a receptive administration with the Newsom administration, but they need to hear this. They need to understand where these impediments are, which means reach out to us, we will elevate it to the governor's office, we'll elevate it to those agencies and get that, get that taken care of as, if we can. This is another reason why I think we need to, you know, I'm gonna be calling for hearings on a lot of this. And so, you know, make a list. Because when we start doing our hearings about how do we help our nonprofits, how do we help our small businesses, I'm gonna need you to give me that, you know, laundry list of actions that we can take. Uh, maybe it's, you know, actions with a two-year sunset, or maybe it's pushing some of your regulatory requirements off for another year or another two years. But I stand ready and able to, to try to make that happen. But I need you to voice those to us, which means reaching out to me directly, reaching out to Allison, who's on this call, or your own representative's office. 
Right. You know, one of the people, one of the questions that's come in is from Camille T. Goldberg, and she's commenting through Facebook, so she can't see the chat form that has the contact information for your staff on this. But she gives a really good example, which is nonprofit day camps here, it says, are operating with a legislative exemption of two weeks. Uh, but many programs started that on June 15th, which means they're running out of time right now. And so they need to get that to be extended. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that it sounds like your office could be a lot of help with because you may not have yep. heard of that issue. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, don't don't assume that we know. So don't assume that your own representatives know about these issues where, you know, we've got a lot of a lot of stuff going on. But let mm -hmm. us know because we want to know. I don't want to find out after the fact. Um, and, you know, one of the other roles that we can play is helping to coordinate between the different groups and the different nonprofits in the area. Um, you know, sometimes Family Promise may not necessarily know uh, um, uh, something that impacts them or their, their own residents. Um, we, you know, we found out that there were, uh, you know, still, for instance, we sometimes hear from constituents who literally can't get food. They don't, and they don't know that there's that there are services available. Let's say for seniors to deliver food to them. Um, but sometimes the nonprofits that do that don't know that there's groups of people who could use their services. So we sometimes act like a switchboard, connecting providers and nonprofits with people who need their services, or even connecting different nonprofits together. Elisa will probably remember years ago, um, I helped start a domestic violence task force in Glendale, and the first time we had our meeting. I was shocked that some of the domestic violence nonprofits didn't know that the police had contracts with hotels that would give free rooms to their victims. They were literally paying for hotel rooms, full freight, not knowing that there were free rooms available. So, you know, if we need to call a kitchen cabinet and get people on a Zoom, we've got the Rolodex to do it. So we're happy to try to connect, you know, to connect different groups, different providers, nonprofits, the cities, um, the gov you know, governmental agencies together to make sure that we don't have overlap, to make sure that we don't have uh, different groups trying to do the same thing or reinvent the wheel. We've got to now more than ever cooperate, make sure that we are sharing resources, um, that we are uh, working together um, because uh, we can't have you know, 10 groups all trying to do the same thing in the same area. It's just not efficient. And uh, a lot of times we hear about groups starting to try to do things where we know there's already another provider in that space in the area. So try to use us to, to, to foster those connections. And I know a lot of you are not in my district. You've got you know, senators and assembly members and council members in your area that can, can do the same thing. Thanks. You know, we have two nonprofits from your district, of course, and they both told very moving stories about the difficulties they're facing, but they didn't specifically specifically ask for help. So, you know, nonprofits that are in these circumstances that are providing safety net, second responder kinds of services, uh, you know, are there some ways that the state can help nonprofits that haven't come up yet? And Lucy, maybe you can chime in on that too, if you know of any. I think I'll let Lucy start because she's probably more in, in the know with anything that's, that's COVID or anything that's new or what's kind of the most often overlooked resources. Um, you know, I noticed that Elisa wanted to say something, so I'm I'm going to pass the baton to Elisa if you would like to respond first, and then I will jump in. <laughs> Mine is actually a question for the assembly member, so um, I will let you all answer questions, and then I will um, torture Laura with my question. So, um, so in terms of accessing funding sources, Dan, is that pretty much? There are, there are some, I know that the county has um, a website with some relief funds that you can access as nonprofits. So I will put that website on the, uh, in the chat for you. It's particularly for COVID-19 relief. Um, and I know that they've given out a lot of grants already to nonprofits. So um, I, that is one resource. That's the one that comes to mind at the moment. So I don't know if the assembly member has any, anything to add, but let me, let me put that in the chat for everyone. I would just say that we are hoping that there's more federal CARES Act uh, stimulus money forthcoming. And you know there, there was a chunk of that that did go to nonprofits, certainly with the PPPs. And we would love to see more of that. Um, I think we're trying to get money out as quickly as we can in the state uh, to the extent that we have money, but 
whatever reserves we had are you know quickly being depleted and with between trying to put money aside to help with tenant relief and now what's happening with the wildfires um, it's just it's a really grim situation out there of, of emergencies put it that way thank you for making that point you know I did want to also add that it's really, for, for all of the nonprofits who are on, it's really worthwhile for you to reach out to your local city councils. And if they are, if your city is big enough to have gotten some of the federal relief, um, to make sure that nonprofits are being included in those in that relief funding. Um, and, you know, to put pressure on, on your county board of soups as well, um, to make sure that nonprofits are included in any of that federal relief. And that money from the first CARES is still going out um, and then hopefully, as the assembly member said, there'll be a second round. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the things when we hear these numbers, like, you know, X number of million dollars going for domestic violence, you know, or for nutrition or something, we don't actually know what that means, you know, and a lot of that is going to cities and counties. And then they're deciding how to spend it. So that's why I think nonprofit advocacy at the city and county levels is really important uh, for organizations to do. Um, sorry, oh, Elise, Elisa, what was your question? So we, we actually did receive a PPP loan that expired in July. Um, we were fortunate enough as many small businesses to receive an emergency relief loan. Um, to Lucy's point, however, our municipality um, removed any small businesses from additional financial consideration because we did receive federal funding. So for those nonprofits that are out there, um, that is a challenge with your local municipalities. But my question actually speaks to um, my larger um, staffing challenges. So going into the pandemic, we were a full-time staff of 18 um, with over 50 part-time employees. Um, after the PPP expired, I put almost all of my staff either on furlough, layoff, work share, or working while on unemployment. Um, the challenge is, is that um, because of the bottleneck at the state and because of how overwhelmed the state is with unemployment, um, many of these nonprofits that were using these instruments to manage cash flow while still trying to ensure that their staff's um, responsibilities could be handled to a certain extent, but also that they could meet their financial obligations and their bills has been really hindered by um, what I can only only equate to pen and paper technology at a state level. Um, and, and one of the things we talk a lot about internally, and you said, hey, let's think outside the box, is how can we use technology to come out of this pandemic more efficient and more effective and provide a better resource to our clients and our constituency. And I'm hoping that at some point we can maneuver our creative tech economy to look at our broken unemployment system and hopefully come up with technological solutions that if God forbid we're ever in this state again, um, our, our people aren't suffering in this manner. So I, I know that it's been discussed both at the Senate and the Assembly, the challenges that the state is facing, but I'm wondering what you and your team have talked about and what sort of hope I can give my people who are on unemployment currently and, and about almost eight weeks into waiting for their last check or their first check, I should say. Yeah, no, thanks. Well, the situation at EDD is uh, I'm sorry, can you move on to somebody else for a second? Someone's knocking on my window. Give me a second. Goodness. Um, I, I, I would just say that, Lucy, you can probably say more too, but we have just heard from so many people that their former staff is in having an impossible time getting unemployment benefits, that their family members are. This is just such an enormous problem, and uh, I'm not sure, you know, yeah, I do know that. Um, oh, it looks like the assembly member's back. I sorry, know that I'm back. Uh, right. Okay, good. So sorry. This is like the thing about working at home. Uh, this kind of thing happens. Uh, in any case, um, um, I'm a little distracted. There was a break in next door, the, the house next door to mine last night, and it was just uh, a, some kind of alarm system guy just came to my house for some reason. I don't know why. You were talking about the EPD and yes. how people so, get relief. The situation at EDD is awful. It's un untenable. It's kind of outrageous. Uh, there's all the reasons in the world why it happened, um, having to do with the fact that we have a system that 
is like Elisa said, it's, it's, I'd say it's worse than pen and ink because you know, I think that the computer systems they use are even worse than if they had had things in file cabinets uh, in alphabetical order. Um, it's, it is awful. And it's, it's to the point where we have never dealt with anything like it at the staff level. I, I have eight staffers. I have four in Sacramento and I have four in the district. And normally the district people do district stuff like cons constituent outreach and the Sacramento people do legislation. Right now, all eight of them work on EDD all day long, EDD cases. And normally when we have a problem, if we have a DMV issue, we can, we have contacts at DMV that we can call a lot of times. I probably shouldn't be telling people this, but we have, you know, contacts that we're, we can sometimes fast track people's issues. We can get some kind of relief or some sort of answer at least, even if we can't solve the problem. We have not been able to really have that with EDD. When we call, we get put in the same kind of queues, the same kind of, of phone, phone calls that don't get answered, the same non-responses. Um, it's incredibly frustrating. I have spoken to the head of EDD multiple times. Our caucus has spoken to them multiple times. We get a lot of promises. We don't get a lot of response. Now, I will say they've hired hundreds and hundreds of people but the people haven't been trained enough to deal with the issue. They still have phone calls that don't get answered. They still have, situ they still have a system where they have deadlines that they're not able to meet. So if people do everything that they need to do and meet the deadlines because they can't meet them at their end, they cancel people's claims. They still don't tell us why they are not filling EDD claims, why they can't um, verify people's identities, why, um, why they can't deal with this. Um, and we have not gotten, we have done hearings, we have yelled and screamed, we've written editorials, we've talked to the governor's office, we have done everything that we can outside of chaining ourselves to the doors of EDD, which I think is next. But what's more, you know, what we really try to do is to, to pound on them until we get relief for our constituents who find their way to us. We are able, we have been able to help hundreds of people. I will tell you, I know for a fact, because I follow up with a lot of my constituents and I call them and I say, what happened? I know you talked to my office. Did you ever get your money? How was, you know, how was my staff? You know, they know my staff's fighting for them, but it is, we shouldn't have to be doing this. Uh, I will say, I will, I will take the, a little bit of the blame off of EDD and say the federal government should never have dumped all of these claims into the EDD departments at the states because they were not equipped to do this. I believe, I'm not an economist, but I believe the federal government should have followed the, the example set by some of the European nations and just directly paid payroll, you know, and just said, your company, we're going to pay, you know, X amount of your payroll directly so those people can stay on their, their health insurance, they can stay on your payroll, maybe they can even work a few hours a week, and we'll pay the rest of the payroll. They could have figured it out in a way where they had done direct payments and not just sent the money through a department that was used to handling whatever they were used to handling and you know, exponentially increasing their responsibilities without giving them any preparation or any chance of being able to respond to the, the tidal wave of claims that came in all at once. So I'm glad the federal government is giving the money. I hope they continue. This was not the right way to disperse that money throughout the, the nation. Other states are having a lot of the same issues. And Elise is absolutely right that we need to fix fix up all of our technology at the state level. I mean, my staff, their computers that they use are like 15 years old. Like it takes them, you know, 20 minutes to boot up their computers every day. Um, you know, they're, they're one step away from like a mainframe and a dot matrix printer. So this has just not been the first place the state has been spending money as they roll money out, uh, you know, is in this kind of technology. And any of you that work in a school system probably experience the same thing. I'm always surprised they don't have mimeograph machines, you know, and teletext. Any non-profit agency the same. Yeah. Thank, so thank, you so, thank you so much for your advocacy on this because it's a really important issue. And, and I think we all feel your passion for your constituents. So I'm really grateful for the leadership that you've taken on this issue in particular. Speaking, yeah, you know, to that, speaking of another old machine. And you know, the thing that strikes me is, Albert, I'm guessing that some of the people that are showing up needing help from your organization are there because they, uh, because they haven't gotten their unemployment checks. So that's all these things are connected and it creates these ripple effects that, uh, that end up, you know, with nonprofits kind of being where the buck ends up being stopped. All right. So
we're out of time. Um, I really think uh, we all owe all of the speakers a real debt for stepping in and being so candid and so straightforward um, and telling us exactly what the story is. So Assemblywoman, can I ask you to close us out today? Well, I want to thank everyone for participating today. Everyone who's either watching remotely and certainly for our panelists. This has been a great discussion. Thanks for allowing me to rant and rave about EDD. It's one of my favorite things to, to rant about. Uh, but I will just say lastly about that, if you're really having a problem, please do contact my office. The information is certainly on the web and it's in the chat. Um, we will do our best to, to fight for anybody that's having trouble with EDD so that you can get the benefits that you deserve. Um, and we are standing by to try to help. Um, you are all leading right now with in amazing new directions and resources and creativity. And I thank you for all of that. Uh, as an elected official, I can tell you that the work that Cal Nonprofits does is incredibly important. And the work that, of course, all of your member nonprofits do is what you know, keeps our communities afloat. I mean, you are you know, really the, the most efficient way and the grassroots way of delivering services into our community. You are the partners of government. You are certainly uh, you know, a part of our community and I thank you. I, I thank Cal Nonprofits for the way that you shape California, pol California um, policy. And Lucy and Jan, thank you for helping us navigate all these issues. And um, maybe Jan, you can tell folks how to join Cal Nonprofits. And of course, I want to thank Elisa and Albert for, for being here today. Well, you can thank so much for the plug. You can see the little thing about below on joining and getting a discount. But I also want to point out something that Christina from our staff put in the chat. You know, with um, a lot of the garages that used to be used as polling places cannot be used this year because they're too small given social distancing requirements. So uh, the LA County Registrar has reached out to us to help them find nonprofits that have spaces that are bigger, like for example, theaters, um, after school programs, uh, community centers, places like that, that might have larger spaces to, to serve as polling places. And that'll also be a good way to help mobilize your constituents and your own staff and volunteers to vote as well. So please take a look at the chat and think about becoming a polling place. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks Assemblywoman. Uh, take care everybody, have a great weekend.